There was another handheld microphone somewhere, right? Okay, great. Okay, great. Yeah. Perfect. So let's see what we can do. So I was thinking that maybe we should do this uh, commemoration of time before and not after. And we should maybe do it twice. Because I think that we can, after the 25 minutes that I will speak, then look back in two ways. Either we can look back through performance, and we would look back at history, or we can look back through dance, and we would look back at history and say, it's no longer the same. And I think this is important issue, actually, when it comes to, however, it apparently didn't work out very well now, because it is, oh, you are a genius, but I will maybe then make that happen in the 25 minutes. So now, it's excellent to be here in Hong Kong, and uh, it's excellent to speak after Andre and Boris, although a little bit intimidating for somebody that has uh, uh, stumbled around in the outskirts of academia once in a while, but have no degrees in anything. So I will try to speak from my position, which is some sort of a person making art. But however, uh, speaking as an artist, I have taken to, I have decided that I need to clarify some terms, which is, of course, it's a very stupid idea. <laughs> but first, I thought of maybe three quotes that I currently appreciate. And um, the first one comes from uh, Henri Michaud from an interview from the late 50s where he's asked, uh, so, Mr. Michaud, when do you think that the paintings in the Louvre are at their best? Saturdays, because there's lots of people, or Tuesdays, because then there's a lot of young tourists and the team of Banda Par wanting to reenact the Godard film is there or something like this. No, Michaud says, no, you know what? Obviously, the paintings are at their best when the museum is closed because then they can be themselves and enjoy it. Second quote um, comes from Godard, which I always only quote in order to look a little bit clever. You know, if you make a performance or something, always quote Godard, and then people say, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally, especially if you do um, sort of the 50s or 60s. The 70s movies, that he's too much of a communist. So watch out. Don't <laughs> quote Godard after 72, because then the curator will say, oh, you're a communist, and then your work will not be uh, presented. Because, you know, there is a problem in our times, and that is, as long as you don't say what you, that you are not a neoliberalist, then you are. But if you're not a neoliberal partaker or caretaker or participant, then your work will not be shown. So don't ever announce what you are. This is a time of, of hyper-individuality, but it's also a time where you never announce who you are. And maybe this is very much a, a, a problem that, we, that comes with several turns and, and with Boris' proposal, is that the, the inability to, to pose a position in our society today. Anyways, uh, Godard says, not a justified image, just an image. And this is from his Sigavarto period, so it's early 70s. Pas image, just, just an image. And the third quote is from Barnett Newman, as you know, the modernist painter in the US, 50s and so on. Um, and he was answering also to an interview, the, the sort of obnoxious American interviewer asking him, but, but Mr. Newman, what do you want with your paintings? And he asks, and I understand this in a kind of ignorant manner, he asks, well, you know, I just want to paint on the canvas to be as beautiful as it is in the bucket. I think that's extremely comical and, and absolutely beautiful. <laughs> um, but these are the three quotes. And I will come back to 
how I, how I consider them to be utterly val valid today, even though they, all the three of them have some 40, 50, 60 years um, to account for. Now, first of all, um, performative turn, so what does the performative turn have to do with performance? I would say silch, nothing. So the performative turn that we experience with the museum world today is not actually performative. It's a turn towards something which has not been in the museum before. But it is not a performative turn. The museum has been performative for as long as it has been open. It's just that there's been different performativities activated within the context. What we see with the turn of, with, with the, uh, perform, with the, when we speak about a performative turn starting in the beginning of the 90s, is a turn where people, having, where people are having a hard on because of Judith Butler's book. It is when, when Butler writes her book about on identity politics, then we cannot not avoid it in the museum somehow. And we can see how this develops where there is a sort of a there is, uh, where the museum captures this with very strongly and, and, and uh, um, through performance as kind of reiteration of 60s and 70s American performance, but now not as a, an, as a matter of augmenting freedom following Andre, but rather as constituting more or less homemade ideas about identity. So now that was the degrading part of my talk, merci. Um, but we are at some, right now we are in an altogether different situation. But yes, the first distinction is performative has nothing to do with performance. Performances are all in some or other way performative, but it's of utmost importance not to bundle it together and say just because to think that because somebody moves in front of us, it is probably performative, and it's probably more performative than something else, and it is probably performance. This is not correct. I don't know what the correct is, but we should, we should negotiate that, of course, the, the, the sort of, you remember, this is not going to be a talk. I'm just going to talk in front of you a bit. <laughs> you remember in 2006, 7, 8, every Biennale in the entire world had a performative section. What was that? It was exceptionally correlated to a moment in neoliberal, uh, in a neoliberal uh, expansion. It was not an act of resistance. Fuck no. This was exactly uh, hand in glove with neoliberal strategies. Excellent. Who was the artist who wanted to be part of the performative program? There was the ones that was, how do you say it, like this. The ones that was not part of the real program. Obviously, who wanted to do a performance? This is something that you can't sell in the Marion Goodman Gallery afterwards. We wanted to be in the real program so you could sell your shit afterwards because as a performance maker in the Biennale, you don't get paid. Or maybe you get paid, but your performers don't. That's not part of the museum economy. And Sergei will talk about this much more in length and more pro uh, prominent tomorrow. But we should make, uh, make clear, nevertheless, performative is not the same as performance. And performance is not one thing. And we should be especially careful with understanding perform performance vis-a-vis -vis an American uh, backdrop. So if we, for example, look into the performance studies um, lineage, uh, which is very strongly a lineage developed out of an understanding of performance vis-a-vis -vis a couple of nodal points in the US, so particularly New York. When Peggy Fallon, for example, writes a famous sentence in her book from 1993, Unmarked, she writes, performance becomes itself in and through its own disappearance. This is valid to a certain kind of performance, but certainly not to many others.
Now, we should come back to performance in a little second, but first to make a distinction in between choreography and dance. And, uh, and then we should make a distinction in between dance and performance. But first, choreography and dance. Uh, with Andre used uh, sometimes choreographic turn and then choreographic turn and dance. And um, this is all okay. But in 1958 was a very important year, uh, as also we saw in Andre's talk. Uh, but uh, I would say that it was also important because uh, Doris Humphrey published a book called The Art of Making Dances. And uh, it's been a great book, both to love and to hate, both to use and to sort of throw away. Um, and this is a treatise on how to make dance. But today we should just understand this, the title, The Art of Making Dances. The Art of Making Dances, could that be choreography? Choreography makes dance. Dance is then made of choreography. Choreography makes dance, dance is made of choreography. Here we have a sort of back and forth situation. And maybe, however, we could also think that the art of making dances should not be understood as one art. And that is what we will come to in a little bit. But I'm interested in this, the art of making dances. Choreography makes dance. Dance is made out of choreography. An interesting thing with, with Humphrey is that she never man mentions what is dance? But she takes for granted somehow that it is dance as we know it. So choreography makes dance as we know it. Being a little bit like too fast, this produces a kind of incestuous relation, which is probably great, but it also uh, produces a bad offspring, so to say, right? And it, and it stays within the possibilities of its, of its own circulation. What it also proposes is a causality in between choreography and dance. So choreography is a set of tools to which one makes conventional dance. Maybe we can make a cut here, right? And say, no, we don't want this marriage, but we want to separate choreography from dance for a moment. And say, no, they are not the same. And they, are not, they don't even have causality. But on the contrary, choreography is something which can, but doesn't necessarily have a relationship to dance. Thinking it like this, choreography is a matter of organizing. Choreography is a structural apparatus. Now, organization, of course, doesn't necessarily have to, to, to mean that we should organize something in a good way. We could also think that we should organize something away from productive opportunities or away from orderly uh, conduct or something like this, right? But choreography, in my understanding, is an organizing opportunity. It structures and localizes. Dance, on the other hand, is exactly, is not a structural organization, but rather a bundle of, particular, of specific procedures, or we can say it also, dance is a strategic opportunity. Now, in my proposal, structures always needs an expression. They need, structures need an entry point into the world. One of them can be drawings, or as, as Andre also mentioned, scores. Scores is already an expression of a, of, of, a, of a structure into the world. One of these, in respect of choreography, can be dance. But these scores that Bruce Nauman wrote, I don't consider that he actually meant them to be realized. They were only there to... They were already realized when they were on paper. They sit on the wall, or they hang on the wall in a museum, and it is me activating the scores that is experiencing these dancings. And dance, on the other hand, is not dependent on choreography to be a dance. We can also consider the opportunity of dancing for other reasons or through other structural opportunities. What these are is an open, open opportunity. But whatever this means is that separating them is 
gives an opportunity for both of them to expand. With this in mind, we can think that choreography is rather than a causal or a directional set of tools to make dance, choreography can be understood as a generic field of, of, of tools with which one can analyze or produce more or less whatever. Maybe not, it's maybe not the most favorable to use choreography to analyze weather. This we have metrology, right? But one thing we know is that if we would use choreography to analyze the weather, it would never rain again. <laughs> rain is something they have in meteorology, but what we would have is an endless amount of grand chetés in heaven. Now, question is, what is worse, right? Falling ballerinas or, or you know, it raining, it raining cats and dogs? That's. Uh, but. It's important to consider this choreography is a knowledge. It's an approach to the world, and it is a knowledge. And this knowledge will also can develop its own languages. It can also and should also develop its own terminology. Dance, on the other hand, uh, is way more complicated. Over the last 20 years, there has been an excessive focus on the choreographic in this uh, binary, in this, in this uh, or po possible in this relationship. Dance was in the early 90s to a large extent um, uh, was uh, to a large extent uh, degraded to be a matter of science, to be a matter of signification and a, and a, and a matter of meaning production. And I think this was an extremely important moment in the history of choreography slash dance. But is there something that we can negotiate with dance that is exactly outside opportunities of signification? Whereas on the other hand, choreography is doomed to stay within. Choreography, from in my perspective, cannot venture outside signification. An order, an ordering is already within the, the realm of the possible. However, we can use choreography to order ourselves out of the realm of the possible. Now, looking, uh, thinking this slightly more practical, would be, you know, one says that architects um, architects are people that are scared or they fear mess. That's why they build, divide space, right? They fear mess, they divide space. Now, thinking about this, so then, ladies and gentlemen, what is a choreographer? A choreographer is somebody who fears movement and therefore organizes them. Choreography has to a large extent, for the last 250 years or something, been all about domesticating movement. It has been about taming dance into something that we can understand or something that we can comprehend. Now then, if choreographers are people that fear movement, what is a dancer then? That's somebody who fears movement and pretends as if nothing you know, as playing innocent. So don't you be on the safe side, dance people. Um, and of course, you know, I've been working in this for 25 years, so apparently I'm a really scared guy, uh, not being able to stop myself, right? But, um, I may be an improviser from a sort of a Shishikian, Shishikian perspective, Dancers are people that are fear movement and pretend as nothing. Improvisers are people that like, you know, they do, they dance as a way of, uh, they improvise as a way of garbage division, you know, ecological uh, small talk, in order, and occupy themselves with this in order not to have to think about the fact that the apocalypse is coming. <laughs> yeah. So they are somehow the people that pretend as if nothing with the consciousness which of course is even worse, right? 
Anyhow, that I only said in order to know, remember what I want to say next, uh, which is, bon. Mm. So there was an interesting point with Andre's talk now, um, which was <clears throat> that how dance was understood to, 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 to com a realm of a pos possibility of freedom in the, in, the, in, the, in the late 50s and early 60s. Um, and I think that's a, quite an interesting idea, and I support it. Um, so let's think about sort of the, a moment of the later 60s, which is when I understand that improvisation comes into the picture. Of course, people have improvised in dance for a seriously long time, but is it the moment when there's vocabulary that, it, that develops around improvisation? Mm. Um, in this moment, I believe that improvisation had a lot to do with, with emancipation in two respects. On the one side, emancipation from the hardship of choreography, or from the violence of Balanchine, or from the, indeed, from, the, 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 from a sort of a domestication of movement. Movement want, needed to be freed from some, something, from choreography, right? And then the second, the second opportunity for emancipation was perhaps, also, uh, was, was perhaps uh, an emancipation of, of the body from the homogeneity of society, or the hegemony of post-World War II American society. We did authentic movement in order to free us from the homogeneity of what one could be as an individual. Thinking about this, say, there's an interesting uh, relationship here, which is like dance improvisation is perhaps also somehow connected with all other emancipatory moments of the 60s. And I was just now thinking a little bit about, or considering to say, just to use these two theoreticians, Deleuze and Guattari, to somehow say that what, of course, uh, five minutes is a great five, it's upper, perfect. Um, um, <laughs> where they, basically what the uh, Anti-Oedipus, their book from 1972 is all about is fluidization, right? So out of structure, towards fluid opportunities, towards strategy, towards, indeed. Now, so dance needed to free itself, dance was improvisation, freed dance, in, freed something in two ways. On the one side, freed the dance from the hardship of choreography, and, it, and maybe even more, the dancer from the hardship of choreography, and it freed people from the homogeneity of society. Now I wonder, what is it that I should free myself from today? Following uh, both Boris's and, and Andre's talk, it appears that the problem today is that whatever I free myself from, capitalism will be very, very happy. Neoliberalism will uh, uh, hug me when I free myself from something because this is an excellent opportunity for a new market niche. Okay, this is a good moment. Judith Butler published her book in 1990, Gender Trouble. This was an excellent moment for theorizing in all kinds of way. But the moment when the subject, which of course is not happening then in the overnight, but with this, with Butler as a kind of a symbolic moment, when this is happening, when the subject is freed from indexicality or a core, Two things happen. We can theorize it. One more thing, we can make money on it. I consider that there is two readings of this moment of identity politics. It gives us opportunities to, to theorize, but it is also an excellent opportunity for neoliberal regimes to also consider how can we corporatize, how can we commodify subjectivity. 
And unfortunately, I think that commodification won the battle against uh, academia and theorizing. And it's no questions about it, right? Two digits. So here we are. Now, in 2014, I need to free myself from something. And the only thing I think about is how would I free myself from capitalism? Which, of course, doesn't happen, right? If capitalism has, has managed to become ubiquitous, and if it all has also managed to commodify or even financialize subjectivity, how do I get out? Doesn't happen at all. However, we will make an attempt. And now in two and a half minutes. Uh, time has also become a commodity in our times, right? But I want to make one more distinction before, and I have done these oblig ob ob I have made this distinction uh, deliberately, slightly unclear, so you have to be in this conference all the way until Sunday night. Uh, otherwise, you could go home now, right? Uh, <laughs> so, but the last one I wanted to do is <clears throat> this re and relationship between performance and dance. I think that what is really important now, right, is that, first of all, the museum is in, not interested in choreography. To the museum, if this is what we are talking about here, it's interested in dance. And the museum is excellently not interested in performance, but is interested in dance. Performance is stuck with identity politics. Performance is stuck in what I can be. Can I be a man like this? Can I be a dance artist like this? Do I look prominent enough as a choreographer with a camo outfit? <laughs> this is the problem of identity. And this is the problem of performance. Performance is a matter of, first of all, emphasizing the performer, who is always in a structure, but it is anyways always the performer that comes across. There is also a very strong this is an interesting uh, parenthesis. Look, who says I'm a dancer and who says I'm a performer? If that person says I'm a performer, you know he's going to be messy to do a contract with. Because he wants to be special, right? This is ex exactly, also again, I will need an extra minute. This is indeed, again, an important issue, right? What happens in the 90s when, we can, when, when, the, when, the subject becomes, when the subject becomes negotiated, when the subject becomes politics, three things happen, right? We can theorize it. Excellent. But it is also when you are not one of us, but your subject is your subject and you perform it and, and there is, you have to invest in it, but it is also you don't want to sit next to somebody. So. So then we can do another parenthesis. It is obviously so that labor unions cannot any longer have leverage after 1990. The worker, Boris Wooden says it very clearly, the worker in the factory has no problem of organizing because we are workers. We are anonymous and we work here from 7 to 5 in the afternoon. So we can also go together and say we protest in a contemporary, immaterial labor situation where my performance is what I sell, I don't want to be in a company class. I want to do my yoga before we start uh, the rehearsals, right? <laughs> this is all a matter of insisting of being individual and of having identity. So the situation that we have after 1990 is you better be special. And what I have sold today to you is being special. I don't know anything about anything. I'm just ranting around. But so far, this guy is at least happy. And that is all I need back, right? I don't need anybody to understand nothing. I just need you to continue to look in my direction. In the old times, you said, look, a bird, and then you could sort of do something on the other side. Now, that, of course, doesn't work anymore. Now you say, look at me, and you can do something on the side. 
say what I mean? In the times of being special, you don't look at the bird, you look at me in order to distract something from something else. As long as you look at me, you're immersed. You're not then in a moment of alienation. Maybe we are, of course. But, uh, so now here we were. Performance is a matter of emphasizing the performer in front of you, whereas choreography is a matter of emphasizing the structures, not the guy who does it. Dance, dance is not the, a matter of performing subjectivity. Dance is more like orgasm in that sense. Instead, performance is about being special and performing subjectivity. Dance is like orgasm. It is the opportunity of not having to be whatever for a long time. When you dance, you're not obliged to be yourself. What we can do with when we dance is to rely on structure, not having to perform. We can just be here, and it's okay. When we dance today, it is not in order to, to, to free us from anything. Rather, what we need to do is to use choreography in order to organize a dance that is freed from us. It is not using dance to free us. It is rather using choreography to free dance from us. And when dancing this dance, having to not experience what is the signification, what is the meaning that I'm proposing, what is the identitarian capacity that I'm performing, but rather standing in front of, or even doing this dance, doing, standing in front or sit, looking at this dance, experiencing this dance as something to which I have no access, to which I, and I should do this kind of in a Kantian way, obviously, to which I cannot use the possibilities of experience, but to which I necessarily need to produce new kinds of, experiment, of, exper of experiential territory. This is a situation where dance in the 50s and the 60s was a matter of freeing us from, from homogeneity. What we need dance for now is to go outside the realm of the performative and rather, <laughs> <laughs> and rather into the future. And no, not even into the future. What dance is all about is to be in the future and look back at history and say, it is no longer as it used to be. In order to go there, however, we have to do this without the subject. So, no, the body is not the last thing alive. Everything is alive today. This is our problem. What, why we need to dance is in order to not have to be alive. Can you put the second slide? <laughs> <laughs> I usually, uh, more, more slide. I usually speak for four or five hours. Uh, this is way too short for me. But it's very good we have a coffee break. Uh, so, what we need to do is not, what we need to do is not to be alive. What we need to do, slide. What we need to do is not to stay alive. This is all our problem. We are so kept alive. Next. Next. This. What we, are, what we need to, we are so kept alive that we all have become living dead. Our problem is that we have all become somehow vampires. We are only drinking the blood provided by neoliberalism, which of course is our own blood. We don't need more life. What we need is to go on the other side, unlife. And this is where dance can happen. Dance is the good, is the nice, is the nice nickname of zombie. It is the opportunity to, for a moment, become somebody, or become some, some, uh, to not even become something, but to exactly just be, just be there without consciousness, and just move through the capacity of existing which is then the differentiation between vampire and, and zombie. Vampires have only life, they are dead, but alive, right? Whereas the zombie 
is, no long, is not alive, but still exists. It is that side where we have to go, where we are performing potentiality, not possibility. So the proposal here is to now have coffee break like this and eat each other instead of the pastry. <laughs> now, <laughs> so this, of course, should not be confused with some kind of American image of it, right? And this was uh, my opportunity of clarifying something. So choreography divorced from dance in favor of dance in, and the perf dance is divorced from performance the, the difference between and performance being the enhancement of personality and strategy, whereas dance is a matter of having the opportunity to not be alive for a moment, but just to exist. And here, of course, is where we should end, right? The three quotes are all saying the museum, when it's closed, is when the paintings are allowed to exist. A just, not a justified image, just an image. An image that is not moral already, that doesn't have an ethic, that doesn't have a politics. An image that just is, that exists, right? And the same thing with Barnett Newman, which is of course not a matter of provide, pr promoting a, a modernism, which was a matter of finding our essence. Now, can you go back one slide? But it is a matter of ending, yes I have, I know, ending with Walter Benjamin saying, no, the essence is not there, we have to look for it. But we have to look for it without life, but just look. In other words, the paint is, is falling back slightly, is slightly melting back into the bucket. And it's in this bucket that we can turn around. <laughs> Gracias. <laughs> And uh, this uh, was uh, just to say, <laughs> this, I find that this is very interesting, especially the end here, right? That an art can never be made, and an art is never made for you or for me. It is there for itself, right? It is there to, uh, to, f to free us, but not from not from us, but to force us to reconsider what freedom can be. So art is not about freedom, it's about the rigor of freedom, which is an altogether different thing. Thank you again. Have a nice coffee and see you later. You're great listeners. <laughs>